then you've got the three sort of lifestyle things, right? How often you eat, like I said, what time you eat and what you eat. So just like you said about the sleep and stress, you could have the best keto diet in the world, but if you're eating all day long and you're a woman with PCOS, you are not going to be able to lower that insulin. Dr. Nadia, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you, Ben. I am so excited to talk all things hormonal health and keto and fasting and just all the great things you're doing. And we'll get to that for sure. But share your amazing story with my audience. Deep dive into why you are doing what you're doing these days. All right. You asked for it. So um, I love talking. I've often said this before. My husband jokes that I'm in my element when I do uh, any talk related to my work. Um, so you've heard me talk before. We've, we've talked a little bit about this. I work currently and have since 2016 work for the fasting method by IDM with Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos. And I started working with them because I met Dr. Fung at a conference and I was very passionate about what they do and what I do. And um, to my luck, I was living in Toronto at the time. I'm, I'm, I was raised in Toronto and I started working with them in the clinics. So leading up to that, uh, I graduated from the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, wow, a while ago, <laughs> way before that, I guess 15 years or so before that. And um, in between meeting Dr. Fung and graduating from the Naturopathic College and becoming a naturopathic doctor, I lived in my home country. So I was raised in Canada, but decided to move back to my home country that I left when I was one years old. So um, 24 four or 25 years later, I decided that I wanted to start my career in Mozambique, which is where I am originally from and why you and I were having a little chat about um, the fact that I speak Portuguese. So I'm from a, a former Portuguese colony, just like Brazil. Uh, Mozambique is also a former Portuguese colony. And so the, the, the official language there is still Portuguese, hence why I speak uh, the language. So big passion for my home country. Once I graduated, I decided that I wanted to go back. and. Uh, Funny thing about karma and uh, life, right? I thought at 25 I was going to Mozambique to help uh, poor people in impoverished countrysides and help people with their health and nutrition. Mind you, I didn't. I don't know that I had training for that, but that's what my passion was, and that's what I thought I wanted to do at the time as a young uh, Canadian-raised Mozambican-born kid. That was my dream to go back and help, uh, sort of starving African children, right? I mean, who, who doesn't have that dream? And so that's what I thought. And, and reality hit when I got there and realized I wasn't probably prepared to do that. And it wasn't something that was available to me. I had a meeting, lucky me, with a minister of health at the time after six months of trying real hard to work for the ministry and work in the nutrition field. And, you know, he looked at me and he said, I think you would be best served to work in the city and help the people in the city that probably want to come and see you for weight loss. And I was like, what? And he said, this is what I think you would do best in, and you would probably be well prepared and researched uh, to do that. And you would do very well. And I was kind of heartbroken and shocked. I also don't think I was well prepared to do that because I hadn't learned uh, weight loss or any of that stuff at the naturopath college. But that's what I ended up doing, at least in, until I figured out what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I opened up a clinic, and to my surprise, in six months, my practice was full. And that's exactly what people were looking for. They were looking for weight loss. They were affluent, overweight people in the city where I was born, and they were exposed to the same things, unfortunately, that most people in the developed world are exposed to when it comes to food and myths and ideas around food. So at 25 years old, I weighed probably 95 pounds. I started working with people about and, and trying to help them lose weight. And I always say that Mozambican people and all the people, uh, the expat community in Mozambique are wonderful, forgiving people because they were willing to be my guinea pigs because I really knew nothing about this. So I didn't have any real myths or any real misconceptions about weight loss. I just, I think I knew nothing. I knew quite a bit about health, believe it or not. At the naturopathic college, we have this great, training and health and disease and pathophysiology and um, all these other things, but I knew nothing about diet and weight loss and obesity medicine or anything else. So I went into it with kind of a clean slate. So I started off sort of coming up with these detoxes, I would call them, based on what I thought was healthy eating. And I, and I just 
uh, researched and modified as I went along. I had a whole bunch of clients, whole bunch of people interested in working with me. And so I got a lot of experience in a very short period of time. I lived in Mozambique for 10 years. Um, and about halfway down the line, I myself started to experience some health concerns. So one thing that I learned in the, probably the first five years that I started working as a naturopath and as a quote unquote dietitian in Mozambique was that a whole lot of women were getting pregnant unexpectedly. And somehow that was connected with my diet. Um, and I sort of very quickly developed this reputation for helping women get pregnant, whether they wanted to or not. And so that was quite kind of a, a funny joke. It, it's a, it's a pretty tight knit community. And, um, because I was the only one doing what I was doing, people knew me quite well. So it was, it was easy, I guess, to, to have a full clinic and, and to work with a lot of people. So anyhow, I also didn't know why women were getting pregnant to be totally honest with you. But as, uh, as I said at the beginning of this, I am a big believer in karma. And five years down the road, I myself find that I am struggling with fertility issues. And I was then diagnosed with PCOS, uh, as you know. And polycystic ovary syndrome is uh, become a passion of mine, helping women with polycystic ovary syndrome and fertility and reproductive concerns has become a passion of mine ever since. Because not only was I already working in that field of people that have uh, different expressions of metabolic syndrome, I didn't know much about PCOS until I was diagnosed with PCOS. And I didn't know that PCOS was actually an insulin resistant condition that could be helped by doing what I was already doing and what I continue to do for the next whatever, however years and probably will continue to do for the rest of my professional career. So that's how I ended up eventually connecting the dots uh, and realizing that I had PCOS, which was a metabolic uh, syndrome expression, an insulin resistant condition that could be helped by uh, a proper dietary and, and lifestyle management. And that's why all these women that had come to me had done so well in not only losing weight and sometimes reversing diabetes or other concerns, but also in um, with their reproductive health. So. At the very beginning of my PCOS journey, of my personal PCOS journey, I hadn't yet connected the dots. And so the only thing that I knew is that my diet, these detoxes that I had been given people, um, helped some women get pregnant. So certainly it was going to help me get pregnant. And because I, like I said to you, I was a very thin young woman, not for any good health reasons, just because I think genetics and because I was a very poor and picky eater, I was a very thin child, grew up into an extremely thin adult. Um, and so PCOS came as a bit of a shocker to me. I now know that, of course, you can have PCOS if you're a lean woman. You can have diabetes if you're a lean person. Um, insulin resistance and, uh, affects people in different ways and different expressions, right? Obesity is not the only one, although it is uh, uh, insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia is common to all of these people, people with PCOS, diabetes, and obesity. And that's why so many of us that look so different uh, follow this lifestyle uh, together and, and really why we can help so many people. So eventually I did connect the dots. But at that point, all I knew was that the diet that helped some women that were overweight become pregnant might help me. And so I followed it. So I followed this very strict low carb diet. And when I tell you strict, I mean, I was probably as strict as can be. Women, uh, when they want to get pregnant, they really want to get pregnant. I wasn't given many other options. That was the other problem. My conventional medical doctor, my gynecologist at the time was of very little help. And I'm very happy to tell you that that has changed a bit. I get a lot of referrals from OBGYNs. Um, all over the world. I work with we, our, our program is an online program. So I get to work with people all over the world. I get referrals. Um, we, our program gets referrals from OBGYNs all over the world. So gynecologists and obstetri obstetricians that realize, recognize that women with PCOS or couples with fertility struggles would very much benefit from having their hormones, as you said, in check through lifestyle management. So intermittent fasting and, and a real food, lower carb type diet. So I didn't know that then, but that's what I did and it worked. I know this story already. I, of course, wouldn't be sitting here with this big smile on my face if that wasn't the result of that. I did end up conceiving, had a beautiful daughter who's now nine years old and a couple of years later conceived again and had another child who was now six years old. Both times, 
I did so with the help of insulin, insulin lowering techniques. Let's put it that way. Fertility treatments didn't work. I did try both times fertility first because that's what people do and it didn't work, but the lifestyle uh, diet or insulin management did. Uh, the second time around, my dear friend and gynecologist in Mozambique uh, was the one that made the connection for me. She said, of course, you're not getting pregnant on the fertility drugs. Remember, you have PCOS, which is an insulin resistant condition. So that's when I made that connection. And so then it became a lot more clear and then it was obvious, right? And then uh, low carb and intermittent fasting became my personal lifestyle, not just to get pregnant, but in order to, to heal uh, certain things that, that followed. Because um, metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance are expressions and syndromes and diseases on a spectrum, right? It gets, as, as, it go, as you go further on the spectrum, you have more and more expressions of, of this condition. So I, I started off as a thin woman who then started to express all these um, symptoms of PCOS. I had severe acne. Um, uh, hair growth, uh, male pattern hair growth, and male pattern hair uh, baldness. So I was losing hair. So it was extremely debilitating. It was devastating. And, and it ended up being very serious, right? I had these cysts on my ovaries. I actually had a large cyst removed, emergency removal. It was seven centimeters at one point. I almost strangled my ovary. I've um, since unfortunately had other expressions. I did eventually gain the weight um, special, uh, especially around uh, my abdominal area. So I had the central obesity. I've had, uh, I was, I had and was diagnosed with primary hypertension and these are all related, right? So at a very young age in my, I guess, early thirties, I was uh, diagnosed with chronic hypertension as in I was going to have this for the rest of my life and was put on medication. I had severe pregnancy complications, which were related to my PCOS because I, admit to you and to all our your listeners and my and my and my clients and listeners that although I followed the diet to get pregnant, I didn't follow through with a low carb, real food, healthy diet during my pregnancies because I didn't think I had to. I thought I just had to do that to get pregnant. And that's all that mattered was, was getting pregnant. But then I had all kinds of pregnancy complications both times. And I did have children that were born uh, with some concerns and later have shown to have uh, expressions of hyperinsulinemia and high insulin. And we now know that this is what happens to children born to women with gestational diabetes or PCOS, high insulin states. So this is something that is, is now become part of my focus. Not only am I trying to help women with PCOS uh, regulate their hormones, improve their fertility, but I want them to know that it's important that this condition be addressed before, so preconception, during pregnancy, and of course, post-pregnancy. I also had a lot of pregnancy, post-pregnancy complications like postpartum depression, um, which may or may not be related. Some people think that it is. All I know is that when I decided to go uh, low carb and intermittent fasting as a lifestyle, it helped that condition as well. And then of course, I had a thyroid nodule that developed into thyroid cancer. And, and this is very likely related to the hyperinsulinemia. So a lot of conditions that I've experienced myself and I deal with people every day that have this. So when I talk to you about PCOS, and I know you don't think it's this light syndrome, no big deal. I know you know it's a serious condition. I know that women that have PCOS know it's serious and debilitating, but that is not exactly the type of care that they're receiving, unfortunately. They're being told it's a very common condition, no big deal, not very much to do about it. If you want to get pregnant, eventually we'll uh, send you off to do some fertility treatments and that's it but it isn't yes it's very common and that's more of a reason for it to be a concern because it's probably the most common um endocrine metabolic reproductive condition in women in their reproductive years so premenopause the most common hormonal condition in, in women very serious as i've said to you many associated things it's not just about a few missed periods, as Dr. Fung says, and a little bit of acne. It's a lot more than that, as if that wasn't enough. But it is, it is a lot more than that, as I've, I've just told you my N equals one. You know, the few things that I've had, but I deal with people that have a lot more than that, 
So they're at much higher risk for heart disease, much higher risk for diabetes. Oh, I forgot to mention that eventually I got diagnosed with diabetes too, of course. So that had to come. Um, and the hypertension I said already and the cancer I said already and possibly the, the anxiety and depression. Maybe it's just because of all the things you go through as uh, somebody who has all of these conditions, but very likely some other relationship as well. So very serious, very debilitating. Not just, as I said, because you're being, at times it feels like you're being robbed of this most biological uh, right to bear children, but everything else that comes with uh, it later on in life, serious conditions, premenopause and then postmenopause. So it's pretty serious, I guess. I started off with a great big smile and then I got real serious. Yeah, it's an amazing story. Well, thank you for sharing that, first of all, Nadia. And it's, it's interesting how, what God does sometimes, you were your first patient, your first PCOS patient, and you fixed yourself and now you're fixing so many other people. I agree with you. PCOS is not something to be taken lightly. It's, it's not similar to, to type 2 diabetes. You know, if you go to the website, American Diabetes Association, they're going to tell you it's a progressive chronic disease that we can manage and treat, but you got to kind of live with it. And that's not true. Same thing with PCOS. And like you said, the common treatment is to send you off to a fertility clinic and it might, they might help you get pregnant, but let's go, let's start, let's start right there. Actually, if that is the most common treatment, at least I think, and if you do get pregnant, they induce pregnancy. What are the dangers of having birth when you haven't corrected the underlying cause of the issue? This is it. So you're, you're completely right. And it is very similar to, to type two diabetes. And that's why it's called di diabetes of the ovaries by some. It's a, it's very much the same and it, it very much, addressed in a similar manner. So first and foremost, women with PCOS are, are prescribed the birth control pill, um, like, I, like I was. I wasn't diagnosed with PCOS, but I had all the symptoms of it as a teenager. But what did I know at 16 years of age? My doctor didn't tell me I had PCOS. She just put me on the pill. And then I was on the pill for uh, until I was trying to conceive, which means I was on it for over 10 years. And every time I tried to come off of it, I had all these unpleasant expressions. So I just went right back on it. Like I was scared to ever come off of it. And so that's the first thing. But then, as you said, eventually, uh, a woman like myself may decide, it may not decide, maybe women with PCOS don't want to get pregnant and that's perfectly fine. There's other things to worry about, right? With PCOS. But let's say a woman decides that she does want to have a child and get pregnant. Then she goes off to see a doctor who likely will recommend a fertility specialist. First line treatment is oral medication, like I took Clomid, Clomifen citrate, very common. Works uh, great in, in probably 30 more percent of the cases. It's, it's a great, it's, it's a very successful medication. It might get people pregnant very quickly. Uh, and PCOS women are not infertile, right? I'm standing right here in front of you. Even before reversing the condition, you can still get pregnant. Fertility treatments work brilliantly in women with PCOS because they have lots of follicles. Um, but that's a big concern because you haven't addressed the problem. And as you said, and as I, uh, as I alluded to earlier, there's a lot of pregnancy complications that women with PCOS are prone to. Miscarriage is a big one, okay, big one. Um, and then everything else that comes with it. Preeclampsia, which I had, gestational diabetes, um, babies that are either too big or too small for gestational age, many neonatal complications. I mean, I write about this. I've, I, I've written about this in um, quite a few of our blogs. It's in our book. This is not something to take lightly. And I want women with PCOS to realize that, yes, you can get pregnant. Yes, I can help you. Many people probably can help you with medication or through lifestyle management to get pregnant. But if you don't address the root cause of the problem, you're going to be subjected to all of these very serious complications and your baby. Yeah. I think women get affected the most when, when they hear that, Oh, it's not just you that's going to have all these complications. Your baby might have serious complications. Yeah. It's, it's really a responsibility to take care of your health for the baby. Uh, and I'm, I'm a man, so obviously I don't get pregnant, but I, I've, I've, I've seen it before time after time when it comes to toxicity, right? If somebody's really toxic, they have a baby that's passed down through, gener uh, through generation to generation, the baby ends up getting sick. So it's really a responsibility to get healthy before you conceive. And it can be done. That's the amazing thing about it. The body is so amazing. It will heal if we start removing the interference. So right now, the most common interference is going to be too much insulin for too long periods of time that's creating this 
a PCOS in the body. Now, is there a time where somebody could develop PCOS and have healthy insulin levels? I've never seen it. Yeah, me neither. Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I just thought I'd ask I you that question. I think that's a great question, but of course you would ask me that question. I was expecting <laughs> your type of questions. However, um, the reason why I say that is because PCOS is known and in, 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 um, sort of categorized as a syndrome of uh, multifactorial, meaning many, many things, both genetic and lifestyle. And so it's possible. I'm going to say it this way. Maybe somebody has, and this is ridiculous to even say, but um, what they say is that you can develop PCOS if your um, mother had PCOS. There's a very big correlation between sisters and first cousins. Um, so that's where the genetic component comes in. And so I'm saying this as in like, let's say your mother had very high insulin levels and had PCOS and passed PCOS on to you. I, I think that what's probably happening is that, as I said, insulin resistance is on a spectrum. So you might be lower down on the insulin resistance spectrum and start to develop some expressions of PCOS because it's the expressions of insulin resistance that I think are genetic. I think you express different things depending on your genetic uh, makeup. And you know this as well as I do, Ben, right? Because why is it that some people are, let's say halfway up the spectrum as far as their hyperinsulinemia and are severely overweight? morbidly obese. And then there's some people that are at the same level of insulin resistance, but genetically they don't express morbid obesity. They express severe type two diabetes. And I see this just as much one versus the other. And I think that's genetic. I think genetically, some people tend to express obesity as their hyperinsulinemia, as their expression of high insulin, whereas other people express maybe central obesity, so they're the tofies, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And I think the same is true for PCOS. We see women with PCOS that are extremely obese and have severe PCOS, and people like myself, I was very thin, and I had the frank type of PCOS, meaning I had all three expressions, all three of the diagnostic criteria, but I was thin. So I, it's not that I, that I didn't have insulin resistance, it's that I just had different expressions. So I don't, I've never seen it. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue if somebody were to show me, there would probably be another reason that I just am not aware of. Yeah, that's, that would be my guess too. It could be a, a genetic thing. But like you said, all genes, most genes are ex, they're turned on or turned off. So it's something else that happened that turned on that gene. But for the most part, it's an it's a insulin issue. Almost all the time, it's going to be an insulin issue. And the person most of the time will show a uh, heavier body weight. They, they might be overweight or obese, but sometimes in your case, that wasn't for you. And that's a genetic component. So that's something to be aware of. If somebody's listening to this right now, a, a lady, a, a woman, or a man who has a, a girlfriend or a wife who's dealing with these symptoms, but they're not familiar with PCOS. The common symptoms, you already mentioned a few, missed periods, acne, facial hair. Uh, you said you also had some, some male potter, pattern baldness going on. Any other common symptoms that people should be aware of? So the three diagnostic criteria are the irregular ovulation, of course, the expressions of male hormones. So it doesn't have to be high lab um, androgens, high male hormones on lab, because that's sometimes hard to pinpoint because hormones fluctuate so much at the expression. So the hirsutism, which is the, the hair growth, right? The acne, the hair loss, which is quite common. Um, in extreme cases, they might have a deepening of the voice. I mean, male expressions, right, in, in, in females. And then the third is these cysts on ultrasound, cysts on the ovaries on ultrasound. So those are the three. The, the obesity is not part of the diagnostic criteria because, again, it may be there, it may not be there. It is there quite often in a certain genetic, uh, I guess, population, but it isn't in others, okay? PCOS is just as common all over the world, it seems. Some countries tend to have a higher obesity rate and some have a lower obesity rate, okay? And so it's the same thing that we're seeing, as I said, with diabetes. Some people are overweight, some aren't. And this genetic expression that you were saying, this turn on or off, I think it's the insulin that does that, right? It's, it's the, if the high insulin is there, it gets turned on. If it's not, it, it, it doesn't. Yeah, all, all roads lead to insulin. High, high levels of insulin is inflammatory, and that's where 
you get inflammation around your cell membrane and that turns on the gene, like you just said. So I, I agree with you. And you know, um, uh, you said something else that triggered a thought and now it's, it's kind of escaped me, but, but it, it had to do with, with the genetic expression. Oh, I know what I was going to say. St studies that have, because there's a lot of studies on PCOS, believe it or not, it's a very well known condition because it's such a common condition. It's just that there isn't a very good conventional treatment for it. But it is a very well known and researched, I think, condition. So the studies have shown that even thin women have a much higher insulin resistance. So it's insulin, it's insulin, it's insulin. So yes, overweight women have the insulin resistance. That's obviously most people don't argue that. But what the studies have shown when they compare women with PCOS that are lean is that in comparison to other lean women that don't have PCOS, they have higher insulin resistance. Yeah, it makes total sense. So that's where a healthy, low-carb, ketogenic lifestyle and intermittent fasting come into play. And by the way, I didn't mention this during our interview. I mentioned, I'm going to mention it in the intro, but you're coming out with a new book. What's the title of your new book? And tell us a little bit more about it, and then we'll get a little bit more into PCOS. That's right. So in April of 2020, April 14th, if I'm not mistaken, our book is coming out. It's called The PCOS Plan. And I say our book because I uh, was privileged to write this book with Dr. Jason Fung, who many uh, people know. Um, he's the author of The Obesity Code, The Diabetes Code, The Complete Guide to Fasting, The Longevity Solution. Now he's come out with the cookbook with Megan Ramos. And so he was, um, I don't even know what the word is, kind enough is not the right word, but he wrote this book with me. And so it was an amazing experience. It was amazing to be able to combine our work my work and his work together to bring out this book to not only, uh, I guess, teach people about PCOS. Like I said, people know PCOS. Every time I do a talk, I ask people to raise their hand. How many of you have heard of PCOS? Everybody puts their hand up. It is that common. Men know about PCOS uh, because like you said, they have a girlfriend, a mother, a sister, a wife, somebody that they know that has PCOS. They might not know what it is, but it's yeah. common. Yeah, for me, I was going to say before I got into the health space, or actually I was, in, I was a personal trainer several years ago, 10 years ago, I kept hearing about PCOS even back then, but I didn't even know what it was. You know, of course I understand it now. So you're right. It was common back then. It's still common now. And they're still getting it wrong in terms of the way it's treated in the conventional sense. The fact that Dr. Jason Fung, who's been on the podcast before, the fact that he said, hey, I want to write this book with you and invest time and research into PCOS is it speaks volumes because there's a lot of things out there that he could be writing and researching about and he chose to do this with you so I hope the audience hears that and, and knows that this is actually something that is serious especially if you don't take care of it uh, and, and I know Dr. Fung's researching cancer he's coming out with another book on cancer in the future so this is something that is in line with what he wants to research and obviously what Nadia wants to research as well because it's that important so let's go back to how a ketogenic lifestyle and intermittent fasting can help somebody with PCOS. That's right. That's, that's totally it. It is important and, and we are addressing it. Um, so how it's, it's actually quite simple and repetitive. <laughs> and I often say to people, if I'm too repetitive, it's a good thing. I mean, this is not rocket science it means you and I, and everybody else can do it. I, I, every day I get people call me. Um, I get a lot of PCOS women call me, of course, as you can imagine. And every day they say, well, have you ever been able to help somebody like me? Everybody always thinks that for some reason they won't be able to get help. But it is that simple. It really is about, as Dr. Frank says, if the problem is insulin, the solution is to lower insulin. And we know how to lower insulin. You eat less often and you eat less of the things that raise insulin. And we're pretty clear on what that is. So it's about really empowering people with these um, just repeating this over and over, kind of like what you do, right? It's like keto, low carb, real food, um, and, and a really proper intermittent fasting schedule. I really focus when it comes, there's really five pillars that I tell people about all the time. How often you eat, what time you eat, what you eat, and then stress and sleep. I, 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 because I say this in such a repetitive way, I often say strep. And I'm trying to say <laughs> stress and sleep all at once, and it, I'm like saying, <laughs> but these are the five pillars, in my opinion, to, to managing insulin and lowering insulin. And so that's the same thing for a woman with PCOS as it is for, um, I don't know, a man with type 2 diabetes and another person with uh, obesity. Yeah, I love that. I love those five pillars because when you are chronically, let's say, sleep deprived, 
you have chronically high levels of cortisol, which means you have high levels of insulin, which is the problem right there. So you could be eating keto perfectly, doing intermittent fasting perfectly, but if you don't have those two other pillars, pillars that you mentioned, which is the sleep and the stress, well, it's just not going to work uh, because cortisol will raise insulin even if you're not eating anything. So that's so important to understand. And yes, it's about repeating this over and over and over before they actually get it. It's going to take consistency and follow through to allow the body to heal. It's not going to happen overnight. It took years for your body to get this way or to get these symptoms. And now we focus on health and the symptoms will go away as a side effect. And insulin is, is huge because insulin is the, I call it the, um, the bully of the block. When insulin is activated, we all of our fat burning hormones, they're gone, they're scattering, and we're in the storing fat state. And then a lot of problems occur. And in this situation, we're talking about PCOS. And your book is going to have detailed chapter after chapter on how to deal with this and what is actually more custom to the person who's dealing with it. But are there a couple of things you can share, some other nuggets besides what you've shared already when it comes to PCOS that are, that are from your book? Absolutely. But again, it's repetitive and it's simple, right? The problem is we're human. And so we tend to want this all or nothing sort of thing. And because we can't sometimes be as consistent as we wish, we fall off, as people say, and then we never get back on. But the trick is to, every time you fall off, dust yourself off and go again. Because it's really the same thing over and over again. You're right about the, what you were just saying. You know, you can uh, do all of these things, but then if you're chronically sleep deprived and chronically stressed. It's not that we're telling you to take away your stress. That's impossible. But stress management, you know, doing adequate uh, techniques and therapies to deal with stress management, sleep hygiene. People very often disregard sleep, especially in this day and age, right? There's all these gadgets and people stay up all night and they, they, a lot of millennials and young people think they don't need to sleep or they just have this deranged sleep cycle. It's, that's not going to, do you good? I know a lot of people say, oh, I can live without sleep. You think so, right? But on the inside, so you have to address this, okay? You do have to sleep uh, and enough, sleep enough, quality, good quality sleep. But then you've got the three sort of lifestyle things, right? How often you eat, like I said, what time you eat and what you eat. So just like you said about the sleep and stress, you could have the best keto diet in the world, but if you're eating all day long and you're a woman with PCOS, you are not going to be able to lower that insulin. I'm, a, I'm sorry to say this. I am uh, a, a, a stickler when it comes to this, okay? Because I myself followed a ketogenic diet for my healing journey, um, and it did me real good. It helped me address a lot of things, food addictions, and um, really getting control of my life and uh, my depression and sleep and all of these things got very well addressed with a ketogenic diet. But the one thing that I did really, really well is that I followed a time restricted eating pattern. Right from the get go, I had two solid uh, eating windows a day. This is before I knew about intermittent fasting. So I, yes, I've done many other fasting schedules, but I, I, I did this before I even got into extended fasting and I got pregnant with these and, and really this was the key thing was to eat in a time-restricted eating pattern. No snacking, no binging, no grazing, none of this. You need to figure out, whether you call it keto or not, you need to figure out a real food, lower carb dietary approach that you can eat rich meals, satiating meals, and tight uh, eating windows, and you're able to eat and walk away, okay? In between meals, your body needs a rest. It needs a rest from all kinds of stuff, okay? Not just food. Uh, it needs a rest from flavored waters. It needs a rest from cream in your coffee. It needs a rest from all kinds of gum. It just needs a rest, okay? Between meals, I think you should be having water and possibly some herbal teas, maybe, or black coffee. I will, I'm a coffee addict. I drink tons of coffee. I love coffee. But even that, I will only have with my meals now in my yeah. eating window. It's a good point because... If somebody, they think, they think, yeah, I'm eating keto, I'm in ketosis, but they're eating every two to three hours, they're grazing, even their keto snacks, you're still going to raise insulin and that's going to prevent your body from healing. So I hope that made sense for you all listening and watching. It's not about, it's not about, it's about how many times you're eating. It's about all the times you're activating insulin. It could be the healthiest snack in the world, but if you do it right and you have your shortened eating window, maybe it's four hours, whatever works for you. And you have those meals until full 
having protein and fat and letting those hormones activate that let you know you're full stop eating that'll be enough to hold you over until your fasting window's done you can have your water you can have your your uh, tea i guess yeah like like nadia's water. drinking right now i have my water here as well so that those are powerful powerful tools and you're right it's nothing that's not rocket science but it's a matter of actually following through with it let me ask you this in your book or in your practice do you talk or do you implement block fasting for the for pcos block fasting yeah three days or, or longer extended fasting okay yeah um you know it's a tool it's a, a tool that can be used strategically it's not it's not my preferred method it's not my go-to method although i think that it's a tool that can be implemented if 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 as dr fung would say it's a powerful weapon and it has two you know it's got two edges so you have to know how to use it appropriately but yes i i have seen it work very well in certain cases um remember that when you're working with women that have fertility challenges they want to get pregnant yesterday and so sometimes uh, i will create protocols for those that are interested and if if they want to get pregnant yesterday then maybe we need to implement some extended fasting and we do have extended fasting protocols and for some particular people that can be useful it's not the greatest weight loss protocol an extended fast is not the greatest weight loss protocol at least consistent weight loss and so it's not even something that we use for weight loss that often but it can be used strategically so yes I agree. I agree. It's a, it's a great tool for getting more autophagy and allowing the body to keep insulin low, but it's not necessarily uh, the best weight loss tool. So yes, health first, weight loss comes as a side effect. Uh, I have a few more questions for you and I have uh, my rapid fire questions coming up for you as well. Let's uh, go back real quick to your book. It's called The PCOS Plan, coming out April 15th, 2020. So this episode- 14, I think, 14. or 17, what did I say? So sometime in April. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can they go somewhere to pre-order it right now? Yes, it's on Amazon. You can pre-order. We'll put a I link- can send you the link, yeah. Yeah, so send me the link. We'll, we'll put it in the notes of this podcast because this will be out before April. Uh, go pre-order it. I mean, especially if you have PCOS or, or gift it to somebody who has PCOS. And most people that you know, a lot of people that you know might have it because it's so common. What was your favorite part about writing this book, Nadia? Mm. That's a good question. Um... I don't know, putting down my story and the story of so many women down, that was so, it felt a certain way. I have to tell you, there's, there's, a, there's a nice feeling that comes with writing my story down and saying it to you guys. And so, today I didn't get to mention other people many times and in the book I've written about certain people that I've worked with and these amazing stories. So that was probably one of my favorite parts. I like doing the recipes. Um, because they're simple and they're foods that I really enjoy. Uh, what I didn't like was that when I was doing the recipes, I wrote down all the macros and I put a whole bunch of work into it. And then Dr. Funk came along and scratched out all the macros. He said, people don't need macros. They just need to eat and stop eating. So that I didn't like, but I myself don't count macros. So I totally 100% agree with him, but I just thought it was something that I had to do. So I didn't like putting a lot of work into that and then scratching it out. <laughs> uh, but that was um it was wonderful i really liked how challenging it was because writing with dr fung is an experience he is a good uh to say good is he's an amazing writer but he's an amazing thinker so the way he sees things and thinks of things and he challenges you to your max he has no issues telling you it this is not good enough it has to be better people deserve better I really like that. And I, I, I experienced that writing that with him. And so I'm very honored to have been somebody who he chose to write with um, and to really get a wonderful feedback at the end. But during uh, the writing, um, he was, he was very challenging, which I appreciate. Yeah. Dr. Fung is, is brilliant. Uh, such a, such a master at what he does. He's, he's a, a genius. That's for sure. And, and you are too. You're a genius because you're helping people. You're empowering them to be geniuses and prevent problems instead of being an intellectual who solves problems like Einstein says. So your book's coming out and uh, I can't wait to read it myself. So you said back in 2016 is when you actually linked up with uh, Dr. Fung at a conference. How did that go? It, it's, it's a funny story. And I tell this story all the time and he kind of laughs. But 
Um, I had written to him quite a bit. I, not quite a bit. I, I wouldn't say that I stalked him, but I, I joked that I did. I wrote to him a few times because I had come back to Toronto. Uh, I had, I, as I said, I lived in Mozambique for 10 years. My second child was born in Canada. I, I, I returned to Canada when I was pregnant with my second child. And then I was on extended mat leave, I will admit. Uh, well-deserved extended mat leave. However, at some point I wanted to go back to work and this was my this was my passion this is what i wanted to do i was pretty certain at that point that this is what i wanted to do so i had reached out to him over email introduced myself said you know i have set qualifications i am a registered naturopath in toronto ontario i want to work with you and he sort of wrote back to me uh, a very quick no but at least he wrote back and said we don't work with naturopaths so that's kind of a joke that we have going on <laughs> and then i met him uh, in san diego at a conference I was with a group of people that he knew well from South Africa that I knew well. And um, that's how we got introduced. And it was very funny because the minute that we were introduced, he looked at me and he said, I know you, you wrote me an email. And I said, that's right. And he, and he kind of, uh, he kind of went like this. And then on the Sunday, just before we went to the airport, he said, I'd like to speak with you. And I said, okay. And that's how it happened at the airport. He, um, he asked me if I wanted to meet Megan and I said, yes. And that, that week I met Megan and we started working together. That's so awesome. Yeah. I love it. Megan's awesome. She's also been on the podcast. Her episode's coming out soon. So very, really cool story. Uh, I love that you shared that. Okay. Are you ready for the rapid fire questions? No. <laughs> oh, let's do it anyways. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite keto food? I'm going to say eggs. How do you cook them? Sunny side up. I like them runny. Awesome. Yeah. The runnier, the better. What about your favorite non-keto food? Sugar. Favorite <laughs> is in love, hate, you mean? I mean, whatever you like to, what would you like to indulge on if just all things were, were like no consequences? I am a sugar addict, hence okay. why I developed PCOS. So I, I'm very weary of it. I'm, I'm very aware of it. I don't have sweeteners. I hate sweeteners. I'm, I hate sweeteners more than I hate sugar. Cause they because trigger, I, they trigger you. Is that why? That's right. They yeah. trigger me in a way that, and they don't satisfy me. So I hate them. I will, I will not have things with sweeteners, but I'm very aware of sugar. Um, it's actually a lie. You know what I love more than sugar is fruit. I love fruit. I love bananas and all diabetics that I know love bananas. Yes, me too. <laughs> All diabetics love bananas and I hear bananas over and over again. And this is, I feel the same. If I could have, you know what, if I could have two foods all day long, it would be bananas and cheese. And my daughter, my first child is the exact same. And hence why I know she's got a lot of these expressions already. So I'm very weary of bananas. I love them so much that it's, it's a rare and, and a, it's a treat. I, I never have them because if I have them, it, I probably won't do very well. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Awesome. You, you got to the, to the root of me. Bananas and cheese. <laughs> so um, what, what was, what's been the best advice you've ever received? Eat less often. Hmm. What's been the worst advice you've ever received? Eat more often. <laughs> yeah, I knew you were going to say that. That's great. Yeah, it's a good one. What, if you had a superpower, Nadia, what would that superpower be? Oh, gosh, Ben. <laughs> making you think late night and uh, over there uh i am not sure i don't know can i get back to you on that one you can let it marinate for a little bit yeah okay. but you got to get back before the episode's over we're okay. almost done oh gosh i'll want me to share mine with you to inspire yes. you yes. for me for me it would be the ability to like read a book in like 10 seconds and absorb all the information. Oh gosh, see? That's <laughs> not what I'm going to say, Ben. I'm going to say something like the ability to eat um, bananas and cheese all day and not get diabetes. <laughs> there you go. Goes hand in hand with your previous answers. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. We're done no. with the rapid fire. Now I want to ask you a couple more questions before we wrap this up. This has been fun. What, what is your definition of perfect health? It's, it's um, when your mind and body feel well, because I know a lot of people whose body is just fine, uh, but mind is not and vice versa. It has to be a perfect sink. Um, and there's a third one. There has to be a perfect sort of social component as well. This is a big problem that I've seen uh, in my time that I worked in Canada, in North America. 
there's a really big social disconnect, unfortunately, that I see becoming bigger and bigger. Not so much in my culture, uh, not so much maybe in Miami, I'm not sure, but not so much in Mozambique. People are very socially connected in good and bad ways, but they are. Uh, in Portugal, still, people are very where I live now currently. But in North America, more and more, I'm seeing people socially disconnected. And so they don't have that type of support. And I see that all the time. I work with people that are lonely. And that plays a big part in, in total health as well, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. Social media is, is great, but it's been doing a lot of the opposite. It's been, it's been disconnecting people. So it's a, it's a tool we want to make sure we know how to use, like you said before, about block fasting, extended fasting. Social media is the same way. It's a very powerful, it's a double-edged sword. So you're right. I agree with you. Great answer. What are you grateful for today, Nadia? I'm, I'm grateful for, for, for life and opportunities. I'm grateful that things don't always work out the way you think they're going to turn out. They turn out better. They do. They do. Sometimes you can't see it until it, it's, it's past and you have the hindsight 2020 vision. So yes, I agree with that. Um, what is the most exciting thing you're working on right now? I know your book's done, so you can't say that. What else is the most exciting thing you're working on? What, what's the next chapter? I don't know. See, this is it. But there is a next chapter that's going to be related to this. Beautiful. Well, Nadia, this has been a lot of fun. I want to acknowledge you for the work that you're doing. I'm, I'm a fan of your work. You're uh, an amazing human being, first and foremost, and you're helping a lot of women and men because it's, it's the relationships that you're making an impact with for sure. I can't wait to share your, read your book and then share it with my audience. So they're going to they're gonna go and, and pre-order it. All, everybody listening to this right now is going to go to the link in the podcast notes and pre-order it. And I want to say thank you for your time and for showing up in this world. You have an amazing attitude and you are brilliant at what you do. So thank you so much. That's lovely. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. Thank you.